Hello, I, <laughs> I'm very late. I apologize. Um, but hey, that that there it is. All right, bear with me for a sec. We're gonna wait for like two minutes. Uh, hello, Nyar. Sorry I'm so late. Thanks for your patience. Alright, I reduced the mic volume a little bit, um, so hopefully that will avoid some of the peaking I've been experiencing. We'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed. Yeah, 30 seconds and then we'll get down to it. Oh man, hang on. Achoo! Oh, I'll be right back. Okay, Roadside Picnic, Chapter 2. Redrick Schuhart, age 28, married, no permanent occupation. Redrick Schuhart lay behind a gravestone and looked at the road through a branch in the ash tree. The searchlights of the patrol car were combing the cemetery, and once in a while one caught him in the eyes, then he would squint and hold his breath. Two hours had passed, and things were still the same on the road. The car was still parked, its motor throbbing evenly, and kept scanning with its three searchlights, the run-down graves, the lopsided, rusty crosses and headstones, the overgrown, bushy ash trees, and the crest of the ten-foot-thick wall that broke off on the left. The border patrol guards were afraid of the zone, they didn't even get out of the car. Near the cemetery, they were even too scared to shoot. Redrick could hear their lowered voices once in a while, and once in a while, he could see the light of a cigarette butt fly out of the car window and roll down the highway, skipping along and scattering weak red sparks. It was very damp, it had just rained, and Redrick could feel the dank cold through his waterproof jumpsuit. He carefully released the branch, turned his head, and listened. Somewhere to the right, not too far, but not too close either, there was someone else in the cemetery. 
The leaves rustled there once more, and soil crumbled, and then there was the soft thud of something hard and heavy falling. Redrick started crawling backward, carefully and without turning around, hugging the wet grass. The beam of light swung over his head. He froze, following its silent movement, and he thought he saw a man in black sitting motionless on a grave between the crosses. He was sitting there openly, leaning against a marble obelisk, turning his white face with its black, sunken holes toward Redrick. Actually, Redrick did not see him clearly, nor was it possible in the split second he had, but he filled in the details with his imagination. He crawled away a few more steps and felt for his flask inside his jacket. He pulled it out and lay with its warm metal against his cheek for a while. Then, still holding on to the flask, he crawled on. He stopped listening and looking around. There was a break in the wall, and Burbridge was lying there in a lead-lined raincoat with a bullet hole in it. He was still on his back, pulling at the collar of his sweater with both hands and moaning painfully. Redrick sat next to him and unscrewed the flask's cap. He carefully held Burbridge's head, feeling the hot, sticky, sweaty bald spot with his palm, and brought the flask to the old man's lips. It was dark. But in the weak reflections of the searchlights, Redrick could see Burbridge's wide-open, glassy eyes and the dark stubble that covered his cheeks. Burbridge greedily took several gulps and then nervously felt for his sack with the swag. You came back. Good fellow, Red. You won't leave an old man to die. Redrick threw back his head and took a deep swallow. It's still there like it was nailed to the highway. It's no accident, Burbridge said. He spoke in spurts on the exhale. Someone must have squealed. They're waiting for us. Maybe, said Redrick. Want another swallow? No, that's enough for now. Don't abandon me. If you don't leave me, I won't die. You won't be sorry. You won't leave me, will you, Red? Redrick did not answer. He was looking over at the highway and the flashes of light. He could see the marble obelisk, but he couldn't tell if he was sitting there or not. Listen, Red, I'm not fooling. You won't be sorry. Do you know why old Burbridge is still alive? Do you know? Bob the gorilla blew it, Pharaoh the banker kicked the bucket, and what a stalker he was. And he was killed, slimy too, and Norman Four Eyes, Culligan, Pete the Scab, all of them. I'm the only one who survived. Why? Do you know? You were always a rat, said Red, never taking his eyes off the road. A son of a bitch. A rat? That's true. You can't get by without being one. But all of them were Pharaoh, slimy. But I'm the only one left. Do you know why? I know, said Red, to end the conversation. You're lying. You don't know. Have you heard about the golden ball? Yes. You think it's a fairy tale. You'd better keep quiet. Save your strength. It's all right. You'll carry me out. We've gone to the zone so many times. Could you abandon me? I knew you when. You were so small. Your father... Redrick said nothing. He wanted a cigarette badly. He took one out, crumpled the tobacco in his hand, and sniffed it. It didn't help. You've got to get me out! I got burned because of you! You're the one who wouldn't take the Maltese! The Maltese was itching to go with them. He had treated them all evening, offering a good percentage, swore that he would get a special suit, and Burbridge, who was sitting next to him, kept winking to Red behind his leathery hand. Let's take him. We won't go wrong. Maybe that was why Red said no. You got it because you were greedy, Red said coldly. I had nothing to do with it. You'd better be quiet. For a while, Burbridge moaned. He had his fingers in his collar again, and his head was thrown back. You can have all the swag! He gasped. Just don't leave me. Redrick looked at his watch. There wasn't much time until dawn, and the patrol car was still there. Its spotlights were still searching the bushes, and their camouflaged jeep was quite close to the police car. 
They could find it any minute. The golden ball, said Burbridge. I found it. There were so many tales about it. I spun a few myself that it would grant your every wish. Any wish? <laughs> if that were true, I sure wouldn't be here. I'd be living high on the hog in Europe, swimming in dough. Redrick looked down at him. In the flickering blue light, Burbridge's upturned face looked dead, but his glassy eyes were fixed on Redrick. Eternal youth! Like hell, I got it. Money, the hell with that too. But I got health and good children, and I'm alive. You can only dream about the places I've been, and I'm still alive. He licked his lips. I only ask for one thing. Let me live and give me health and the children. Will you shut up? Red finally said. You sound like a dame. If I can, I'll get you out. I'm sorry for your Dina. She'll have to hit the streets. Dina! The old man whispered hoarsely. My little girl. My beauty. They're spoiled, Red. I've never refused them anything. They'll be lost. Arthur, my Artie. You know him, Red. Have you ever seen anything like him? I told you, if I can, I'll save you. No, Burbridge said stubbornly. You'll get me out no matter what. The golden ball. Do you want me to tell you where it is? Go ahead. Burbridge moaned and stirred. My legs! Feel how they are! Redrick reached out and moved his hand down his leg below the knee. The bones! He moaned. Are the bones still there? They're there. Stop fussing. You're lying. Why lie? You think I don't know? I've never seen it happen? Actually, all he could feel was the kneecap. Below, all the way to the ankle, the leg was like a rubber stick. You could tie knots in it. The knees are whole, Red said. You're probably lying, Burbridge said sadly. Well, all right, just get me out. I'll give you everything. The golden ball. I'll draw you a map. I'll show you all the traps. I'll tell you everything. He promised other things too, but Redrick wasn't listening. He was looking at the highway. The spotlights weren't racing across the shrubbery anymore. They were frozen. They converged on that obelisk. In the bright blue fog, Redrick could see the bent black figure wandering among the crosses. The figure seemed to be moving blindly straight into the lights. Redrick saw it bump into a huge cross, stumble, bump into the cross again, walk around it, and continue on, its arms outstretched before it, fingers spread wide. Then it suddenly disappeared, as though it fell underground. It surfaced a few seconds later, to the right and farther away, stepping with a bizarre and human stubbornness like a wind-up toy. Suddenly the lights went out. The transmission squealed, the engine roared, and the blue and red signal lights showed through the shrubs. The patrol car tore away, accelerated wildly, and raced toward town. It disappeared behind the wall. Redrick gulped and unzipped his jumpsuit. They've gone away, Burbridge muttered feverishly. Red, let's go! Hurry! He shifted around, felt for and found his bag, and tried to get up. Let's go! What are you waiting for? Redrick was still looking toward the road. It was dark now, and nothing could be seen, but somewhere out there he was stalking, like an automaton, stumbling, falling, bumping into crosses, getting tangled in the shrubs. All right, Red said out loud. Let's go. He lifted Burbridge. The old man clamped onto his neck with his left hand. Redrick, unable to straighten up, crawled with him on all fours through the hole in the wall, grabbing the wet grass. Let's go! Let's go! Burbridge whispered hoarsely. Don't worry, I've got the swag! I won't let go! Come on! The path was familiar, but the wet grass was slippery. The ash branches whipped him in the face. The bulky old man was unbearably heavy, like a corpse, and the bag with the booty clinking and clanging kept getting caught, and he was afraid of running into him, who could be anywhere in the dark. When they got out onto the highway, it was still dark, but you could tell that dawn was coming. 
In the little wood across the road, birds were making sleepy and uncertain noises, and the night gloom was turning blue over the black houses in the distant suburbs. There was a chilly, damp breeze coming from there. Redrick put Burbridge on the shoulder of the road, and like a big black spider scuttled across the road. He quickly found the jeep, swept off the branches from the hood and fenders, and drove out onto the asphalt without turning on the headlights. Burbridge was there, holding the bag in one hand and feeling his legs with the other. Hurry up! Hurry! My knees! I still have my knees! If only we could save my knees! Redrick picked him up, and gritting his teeth from the strain, shoved him over the side. Burbridge landed on the back seat and groaned. He hadn't dropped the bag. Redrick picked up the lead-lined raincoat and covered him with it. Burbridge had even managed to get the coat out. Redrick took out a flashlight and checked the shoulder for tracks. There weren't too many traces. The jeep had flattened some of the tall grass as it had came onto the road, but the grass would stand up in a couple of hours. There were an enormous number of butts around the spot where the patrol car had parked that reminded Redrick that he wanted a smoke. He lit one up, even though what he wanted more was to get the hell out of there and drive as fast as he could. But he couldn't do that yet. Everything had to be done slowly and consciously. What's the matter? Burbridge whined from the car. You haven't spilled the water and the fishing gear is dry. What are you waiting for? Come on, hide the swag. Shut up. Don't bug me. We'll head for the southern suburbs. What suburbs? Are you crazy? You ruined my knees, you bastard. My knees! Redrick took a last drag and put the butt in his matchbox. Don't be a jerk, buzzard. We can't go straight through town. There are three roadblocks. We'll get stopped once for sure. So what? You'll take one look at your feet and its curtains. What about my legs? We were fishing. I hurt my legs. That's that. And what if they feel your legs? Feel them? I'll yell so loud that they'll never try feeling a leg again. But Redrick had already Redrick had already decided. He lifted the driver's seat, flashing his light, opened a secret compartment, and said, Let me have the stuff. The gas tank under the seat was a dummy. Redrick took the bag and stuffed it inside, listening to the clinking and clanging in the bag. I can't take any risks, he muttered. I don't have the right. He put the cover back on, covered it up with rubbish and rags, and replaced the seat. Burbridge was moaning and groaning, begging him to hurry and promising him the golden ball again. He twisted and shifted in his seat, staring anxiously into the growing light. Redrick paid no attention to him. He tore open the plastic bag of water with the fish in it, poured out the water over the fishing gear, and put the flopping fish into the basket. He folded up the plastic bag and put it in his pocket. Now, everything was in order. Two fishermen coming back from a not very successful trip. He got behind the wheel and started the car. He drove all the way to the turn without putting on the lights. The vast, ten-foot wall stretched to the left of them, hemming in the zone, and on their right, there were occasional abandoned cottages with boarded windows and peeling paint. Redrick could see well in the dark, and it wasn't that dark anymore anyway, and besides, he knew that it was coming. So, when the bent figure, striding rhythmically, appeared before the car, he didn't even slow down. He hunched over the wheel. He was walking in the middle of the road, like all of them, he was headed for town. Redrick passed him from the left and speeded up. Mother of God, Burbridge muttered in the back seat. Red, did you see that? Yes. God, that's all we need. Suddenly, Burbridge broke into a loud prayer. Shut up, Redrick shouted at him. The turn should have been right around there somewhere. Redrick slowed down, staring at the row of sinking houses and fences on the right. The old transformer hut, the pole with the supports, the rotting bridge over the culvert. Redrick turned the wheel. The car tossed and turned. Where are you going? Burbridge wailed. You'll ruin my legs, you bastard! Redrick turned around for a second and slapped the old man's face, feeling his prickly stubbled cheek. Burbridge sputtered and fell silent. The car was bouncing and the wheels slipped in the fresh mud from last night's rain. Redrick turned on the lights, 
the white bouncing light illuminated overgrown old ruts, huge puddles, and rotten, leaning fences. Burbridge was crying, sobbing, and snuffling. He wasn't promising anything anymore. He was complaining and threatening, but in a very quiet and indistinct voice, so that Redrick heard only isolated words, something about legs, knees, and his darling Archie. Then he shut up. The village stretched along the western edge of the city. There once had been summer houses, gardens, orchards, and the summer villas of the city fathers and plant directors. Green, pleasant places with small lakes and clean, sandy beaches, translucent birch groves, and ponds stocked with carp. The stink and pollution from the plant never reached this verdant glade, nor did the city plumbing system. But now, everything here was abandoned, and they passed only one inhabited house. The window shone yellow through the drawn blinds, the wash on the line was wet from the rain, and a huge dog rushed out at them furiously and chased the car through the mud thrown up by the wheels. Redrick carefully drove over an old rickety bridge. When he could see the turnoff to Western Highway, he stopped the car and turned off the motor. Then he got out and went on the road without looking back at Burbridge, his hands stuffed into the damp pockets of his jumpsuit. It was light. Everything around them was wet, still, and sleepy. He walked over to the highway and peered from the bushes. The police checkpoint was easily visible from his vantage point, a little trailer house with three lighted windows. The patrol car was parked next to it. It was empty. Redrick stood watching for some time, there was no action at the checkpoint. The guards must have gotten cold and worn out during the night and were warming up in the trailer, dreaming over cigarettes stuck to their lower lips. The toads, Redrick said softly. He found the brass knuckles in his pocket, slipped his fingers into the oval holes, pressed the cold metal into his fist, and still hunched up against the chill, and with his hands still in his pockets, he went back. The jeep, listing slightly to one side, was parked among the bushes. It was a lost, quiet spot. Probably nobody had looked at it in the last ten years. When Redrick reached the car, Burbridge sat up and looked at him, his mouth open. He looked even older than usual, wrinkled, bald, unshaven, and with rotten teeth. They stared at each other silently, and then Burbridge said distinctly, The map! All the traps! Everything! You'll find it, and you won't be sorry. Redrick listened to him without moving. Then he loosened his fingers and let the brass knuckles fall into his pocket. All right, all you have to do is lie there in a faint. Understand? Moan, and don't let anyone touch you. He got behind the wheel and started the car. Everything went well. No one got out of the trailer when the jeep drove slowly past, obeying all the signs and making all the correct signals. It accelerated and sped into town through the southern end. It was 6 a.m. The streets were empty, the pavement wet and shiny, black, and the traffic lights winked lonely and unneeded at the intersections. They drove past the bakery with its high, brightly lit windows, and Redrick was engulfed in a wave of the warm, incredibly delicious smell of baking bread. I'm starved, Redrick said, and stretched his stiffened muscles by pushing his hands into the wheel. What? Burbridge asked, frightenedly. I'm starved, I said. Where to? Home or straight to the butcher? To the butcher! And hurry! Burbridge was ranting, leaning forward and breathing hotly on Redrick's neck. Straight to his house! Come on! He still owes me seven hundred! Will you drive faster? You're crawling like a louse in a puddle. He started cursing impotently and angrily, sputtering, panting. It ended in a coughing fit. Redrick did not answer. He had neither the time nor the energy to pacify Buzzard when he was going at full speed. He wanted to finish up as soon as possible and get an hour or so of sleep before his appointment at the Metropole. He turned onto 16th Street, drove two blocks, and parked in front of a gray, two-story private house. The butcher came to the door himself. He had just gotten up and was on his way to the bathroom. He was wearing a luxurious robe with gold tassels and was carrying a glass with his false teeth. 
His hair was disheveled, and there were dark circles under his eyes. Oh, it's Red. So, how are you? Put in your teeth and let's go. Uh huh. He nodded him into the waiting room and hurried off to the bathroom, scuffing along in his Persian slippers. Who is it? He asked from there. Burbridge. What? His legs. Redrick could hear running water, snorting, splashing, and something fall and roll along the tile floor in the bathroom. Redrick sank exhaustedly into an armchair and lit a cigarette. The waiting room was nice. The butcher didn't skimp. He was a highly competent and very fashionable surgeon, influential in both city and state medical circles. He had gotten mixed up with the stalkers, not for the money, of course. He collected from the zone. He took various types of swag, which he used for research in his practice. He took knowledge, since he studied stricken stalkers, and the various diseases, mutilations, and traumas of the human body that had never been known before. And he took glory, becoming famous as the first doctor on the planet to be a specialist in non-human diseases of man. He was also not averse to taking money, and in great amounts. "'What specifically is wrong with his legs?' he asked, appearing from the bathroom with a huge towel around his neck. He was carefully drying his sensitive fingers with the corner of the towel. "'Landed in the jelly,' Redrick said. The butcher whistled. "'Well, that's the end of Burbridge. Too bad he was a famous stalker.' "'It's all right,' Redrick said, leaning back in the chair. "'You'll make artificial legs for him.' He'll hobble around the zone on them. All right. The butcher's face became completely businesslike. Wait a minute. I'll get dressed. While he dressed and made a call, probably to his clinic to prepare things for the operation, Redrick lounged immobile in the armchair and smoked. He moved only once to get his flask. He drank in small sips because there was only a little on the bottom, and he tried to think about nothing. He simply waited. They both walked out to the car. Redrick got in the driver's seat, the butcher next to him. He immediately bent over the back seat to palpate Burbridge's legs. Burbridge, subdued and withdrawn, muttered pathetically, promising to shower him with gold, mentioning his deceased wife and his children repeatedly, and begging him to save at least his knees. When they got to the clinic, the butcher cursed at not finding the orderlies waiting at the driveway and jumped out of the moving car to run inside. Redrick lit another cigarette. Burbridge suddenly spoke, clearly and calmly, apparently completely calm at last. You tried to kill me. I won't forget. I didn't kill you, though, Redrick said. No, you didn't. He was silent. No, remember that, too. You do that. Of course you wouldn't have tried to kill me. He turned and looked at Burbridge. The old man was nervously moving his lips. You would have abandoned me, just like that, said Redrick. You would have left me in the zone and thrown me in the water, like Four Eyes. Four Eyes died on his own, Burbridge said gloomily. I had nothing to do with it. It got him. You bastard, Redrick said dispassionately, turning away. You son of a bitch. The sleepy, rumpled attendants ran out onto the driveway, unfurling the stretcher as they came to the car. Redrick, stretching and yawning, watched them extricate Burbridge from the back seat and trundle him off on the stretcher. Burbridge lay immobile, hands folded on his chest, staring resignedly at the sky. His huge feet, cruelly eaten away by the jelly, were turned out unnaturally. He was the last of the old stalkers who had started hunting for treasure right after the visitation, when the Zone wasn't called the Zone, when there were no institutes or walls or UN forces, when the city was paralyzed with fear and the world was snickering over the new newspaper hoax. Redrick was ten years old then, and Burbridge was still a strong and agile man. He loved to drink when others paid, to brawl, to catch some unwary girl in a corner. His own children didn't interest him in the least, and he was a petty bastard even then. When he was drunk, he used to beat his wife with a repulsive pleasure, noisily, so that everyone could hear. He beat her until she died. 
Redrick turned the jeep and, disregarding the lights, sped home, honking at the few pedestrians on the streets and cornering sharply. He parked in front of the garage, and when he got out, he saw the superintendent coming toward him from across the little park. As usual, the super was out of sorts, and his crumpled face with its swollen eyes mirrored extreme distaste, as though he were walking on liquid manure instead of the ground. "'Good morning,' Redrick said politely. The super stopped two feet in front of him and pointed with his thumb over his shoulder. "'Is that your handiwork?' he asked. You could tell that those were his first words of the day. "'What are you talking about?' The swings. Was it you who set them up? I did. What for? Redrick did not answer and went over to unlock the garage door. The super followed. I asked you why you set up the swings. Who asked you to? My daughter, he answered very calmly. He rolled back the door. I'm not asking you about your daughter. He raised his voice. That's another question. I'm asking you who gave you permission. I mean, who let you take over the park? Redrick turned to him and stared at the bridge of his nose, pale and covered with spidery veins. The stupor stepped back and spoke more softly. And don't you repaint the terrace. How many times have I... Don't bother. I'm not going to move out. He got back in the car and started the engine. As he took the wheel, he saw how white his knuckles were. Then he leaned out the window and, no longer controlling himself, said, But if I'm forced to move, you creep, you better say your prayers. He drove into the garage, turned on the light, and closed the door. He pulled the swag from the false gas tank, fixed up the car, put the bag in an old wicker basket, put the fishing gear, still damp and covered with grass and leaves, on top, and put the fish that Burbridge had bought in a store in the suburbs last night on top of everything. Then he checked the car one more time, out of habit. A flattened cigarette butt had stuck to the right rear fender. Redrick pulled it away. It was Swedish. He thought about it and put it into the matchbox. There were three butts in it already. He didn't meet anyone on the stairs. He stopped in front of his door, and it flew open before he had time to get his keys. He walked in sideways, holding the heavy basket under his arm, and immersed himself in the warmth and familiar smells of home. Guta threw her, uh, threw her arms around his neck and froze with her face on his chest. He could feel her heart beating wildly even through his jumpsuit and heavy shirt. He didn't rush her. He stood patiently and waited for her to calm down, even though he fully sensed for the first time just then how tired and worn out he was. All right she finally said in a low, husky voice and let go of him. She turned on the light in the entry and went into the kitchen. I'll have the coffee ready in a minute, she called. I brought some fish, he said in an artificially hearty tone. Fry it up, won't you? I'm starved. She came back, hiding her face in her loosened hair. He set the basket on the floor, helped her take out the net with the fish, and they both carried the net to the kitchen and dumped the fish into the sink. But wash up, she said. By the time you're ready, the fish will be done. How's Monkey? Redrick asked, pulling off his boots. She was babbling all evening, Guda replied. I barely got her to go to bed. She keeps asking, where's Daddy? Where's Daddy? She wants her Daddy all the time. She moved swiftly and quietly in the kitchen, strong and graceful. The water was boiling in the pan on the stove, and the scales were flying under her knife, and the butter was sizzling in the largest pan, and there was the exhilarating smell of fresh coffee in the air. Redrick walked in his bare feet to the entry hall, took the basket, and brought it to the storeroom. Then he looked into the bedroom. Monkey was sleeping peacefully, her crumpled blanket hanging on the floor. Her nightie had ridden up. She was warm and soft, a little animal breathing heavily. Redrick could not resist the temptation to stroke her back, covered with warm, golden fur, and was amazed for the thousandth time by the fur's silkiness and length. He wanted to pick up Monkey badly, but he was afraid it would wake her up. Besides, he was as dirty as hell and permeated with death in the zone. He came back into the kitchen and sat down at the table. Pour me a cup of coffee. I'll wash up later. A bundle of evening mail was on the table. The Harmont Gazette, Sports, Playboy, 
There was a whole bunch of magazines, and the thick, gray-covered Reports of the International Institute of Extraterrestrial Cultures, issue 56. Redrick took a mug of steaming coffee from Gouda and reached for the reports. Squiggles and markings, blueprints of some kind, and photographs of familiar objects from strange angles. Another posthumous article by Kirill, an unexpected property of the magnetic trap Type 77B. The surname Panov was framed in black, and below, in tiny type, it said, Dr. Kirill A. Panov, USSR, perished tragically during an experiment in April 19... Redrick tossed away the journal, gulped some coffee, burning his mouth, and asked, Did anyone drop by? Gutalin was here, Guda said after a slight pause. She was standing by the stove and looking at him. He was stinking drunk. I sobered him up. How about Monkey? She didn't want to let him go, of course. She started bawling, but I told her that Uncle Kutalin wasn't feeling very well, and she told me Kutalin smashed again. Redrick laughed and took another sip. Then he asked another question. Fix the music. Hang on. Then he asked another question. And what about the neighbors? Uda hesitated again before answering. Like always, she finally said. All right, don't tell me. Ah, she said, waving her hand in disgust. The woman from below knocked at our door last night. Her eyes were bulging and she was practically spitting with anger. Why are we sawing in the bathroom in the middle of the night? She asked. The dangerous old bitch. Redrick said through his teeth. Listen, maybe we should move. Buy a house somewhere out in the country where there's no one else. Some old abandoned cottage. What about Monkey? Oh, don't you think the two of us could make her life good? Gouda shook her head. She loves children, and they love her. It's not their fault that... No, oh, it's not their fault. There's no use talking about it. Uta said. Somebody called you. Didn't leave a name. I told him you were out fishing. Redrick put down the mug and got up. Okay, I'll go wash up. I've got lots of things to take care of. He locked himself in the bathroom, threw his clothes in the pail, and placed the brass knuckles, the remaining nuts and bolts, and his cigarettes on the shelf. He turned himself under the boiling hot shower for a long time, rubbing his body with a rough sponge until it was bright red, he shut off the shower and sat on the edge of the tub, smoking. The pipes were gurgling, and Guta was clattering dishes out in the kitchen. Then there was the smell of frying fish, and Guta knocked, bringing him fresh underwear. Hurry it up, she ordered. The fish is getting old. I'm sorry, the fish is getting cold. She was completely back to normal, and back to being bossy. Redrick chuckled as he dressed, that is, put on his shorts and t-shirt, and went to the table. Now I can eat, he said as he seated himself. Did you put your underwear in the pail? Uh-huh, he said with his mouth full. Good fish. Did you cover it with water? Nope. Sorry, sir. Won't happen again, sir. Will you sit still? Forget it. He caught her hand and tried to pull her into his lap, but she pulled away and sat across from him. You're neglecting your husband. Redrick said, his mouth full again. Too squeamish? Some husband you are now. You're just an empty bag, not a husband. You have to be stuffed first. What if I could be? Redrick said. Miracles do happen, you know. I haven't seen miracles like that from you before. How about a drink? Redrick played with his fork indecisively. No, thanks. He looked at his watch and got up. I'm off now. Get my dress-up outfit ready. First class, a shirt and tie. Enjoying the sensation of the cool floor under his clean, bare feet, he went into the storeroom and barred the door. He put on a rubber apron and rubber gloves up to his elbows and started unloading the swag on the table. Two empties, a box of pins, nine batteries, three bracelets, some kind of hoop, sort of like the bracelets, but of white metal, lighter and bigger in diameter by an inch, 16 black sprays in a polyethylene case, two marvelously preserved sponges the size of a fist, three itchers, a jar of carbonated clay, 
There was still a heavy porcelain container carefully wrapped in fiberglass in the bag, but Redrick didn't touch it. He smoked and examined the wealth spread out on the table. Then he opened a drawer and took out a piece of paper, a pencil stump, and a calculator. He kept the cigarette in the corner of his mouth, and, squinting in the smoke, he wrote number after number, making three columns in all. He added up the first two. The numbers were impressive. He put out the butt in an ashtray and carefully opened the box and spilled out the pins on the paper. In the electric light, the pins looked slightly blue and occasionally sputtered with other colors, yellow, red, and green. He picked up a pin and carefully squeezed it between his thumb and index finger, avoiding being pricked. Then he put out the light and waited a bit, getting accustomed to the dark. But the pin was silent. He put it aside and found another one, which he also squeezed. Nothing. He squeezed harder, risking a pin prick, and the pin spoke. Weak red flashes ran along the pin and were suddenly replaced by slower green pulses. Redrick enjoyed this strange light play for a few seconds. He had learned from the reports that the lights were supposed to mean something, maybe something very important. He put the pin in a different spot from the first and picked up another. He ended up with 73 pins, 12 of which spoke. The rest were silent. Actually, they too could speak, but fingers were not enough to get them started. You needed a special machine the size of the table. Redrick put on the light and added two more numbers to his list, and only then did he decide to do it. He stuck both hands into the bag, and holding his breath, brought out a soft package and placed it on the table. He stared at it for a while, thoughtfully rubbing his chin with the back of his hand. Then he picked up the pencil, played with it with his clumsy, rubbery fingers, and put it aside. He took another cigarette and smoked the entire thing without taking his eyes off the package. What the hell? He said out loud and decisively stuffed the package back into the bag. That's it. Enough. He quickly gathered all the pins into the box and got up. It was time to go. He probably could get a half hour's sleep to clear his head, but on the other hand, it was probably a much better idea to get there early and check out the situation. He took off the gloves, hung up his apron, and left the storeroom without turning out the light. His suit was ready and laid out on the bed. Redrick got dressed. He was doing his tie in front of the mirror when the floor creaked behind him and he heard heavy breathing, and he made a face to keep from laughing. Ha! A tiny voice shouted next to him, and someone grabbed his leg. Oh, oh! Redrick exclaimed, falling back onto the bed. Monkey, laughing and squealing, immediately clambered up on him. She trampled him, pulled his hair, and inundated him with an endless stream of news. The neighbor's boy, Willie, tore off Dolly's leg. There was a new kitten on the third floor, all white and with red eyes. He probably didn't listen to his mama and went into the zone. She had porridge and jam for dinner. Uncle Kutalin was smashed again and was sick. He even cried. Why don't fish drown if they live in water? Why didn't mama sleep at night? Why are there five fingers and, and only two hands, and only one nose? Redrick carefully hugged the warm creature that was crawling all over him and looked into the huge, dark eyes that had no whites at all and cuddled his cheek against the plump little cheek covered with silky golden fleece. Monkey, my little monkey, you sweet little monkey, you. The phone rang by his ear. He picked up the receiver. I'm listening. Silence. Hello? Hello? No answer. There was a click, and then short, repeated tones. Redrick got up, put Monkey on the floor, and put on his trousers and jacket, no longer listening to her. Monkey chattered on nonstop, but he only smiled with his lips in a distracted way. Finally, she announced that Daddy had bit off his tongue and swallowed it, and left him in peace. He went back into the storeroom, put everything from the table into a briefcase, got his brass knuckles from the bathroom, came back to the storeroom, took the briefcase in one hand and the basket with the bag in the other, and went out, carefully locked the door, and called out to Guta. I'm leaving. When will you be back? Guta came out of the kitchen. She had done her hair and put on makeup. She was no longer wearing her robe either, but a house dress, his favorite one, bright blue and low cut. I'll call, he said, looking at her. He walked over and kissed her cleavage. You'd better go. 
Guta said softly. What about me? Kiss me, Monkey whined, pushing between them. He had to bend down even lower. Guta watched him steadily. Nonsense, he said. Don't worry, I'll call. On the landing below theirs, Redrick saw a fat man in striped pajamas fussing with the lock to his door. A warm, sour smell was coming from the depths of his apartment. Redrick stopped. Good day. The fat man looked at him cautiously over his fat shoulder and muttered something. Your wife dropped by last night, Redrick said. Uh, something about a sawing, some kind of misunderstanding. What do I care? The man in the pajamas said. My wife was doing the laundry last night, Redrick continued. If we disturbed you, I apologize. I didn't say anything. Be my guest. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Redrick went outside, dropped into the garage, put the basket with the bag in the corner, covered it with an old seat, looked over his work, and went out into the street. It wasn't a long walk. Two blocks to the square, then through the park, and one more block to Central Boulevard. In front of the Metropole, as usual, there was a shiny array of cars gleaming chrome and lacquer. The porters in raspberry red uniforms were lugging suitcases into the hotel, and some foreign-looking people were standing around in groups of two and three, smoking and talking on the marble steps. Redrick decided not to go in yet. He made himself comfortable under the awning of a small cafe across the street, ordered coffee, and lit up a cigarette. Not two feet from his table were three undercover men from the International Police Force, silently and quickly eating grilled hot dogs Harmont style and drinking beer from tall glass steins. On the other side, some ten feet away, a sergeant was gloomily devouring french fries, his fork in his fist. His blue helmet was set upside down on the floor by his chair, and his shoulder holster draped on the chair back. There were no other customers. The waitress, an elderly woman he didn't know, stood behind the counter and yawned, genteely covering her painted mouth with her hand. It was twenty to nine. Redrick saw Richard Noonan leave the hotel, chewing something and arranging his soft hat on his head. He boldly strode down the steps, short, plump, and pink, still lucky, well off, freshly washed, and confident that the day would bring him no unpleasantness. He waved to someone, flung his raincoat over his shoulder, and walked over to his Peugeot. Dick's Peugeot was also plump, short, freshly washed, and seemingly confident that no unpleasantness threatened it. Covering his face with his hand, Redrick watched Noonan bustle, get comfortable in the front seat, move something from the front seat to the back, bend down to pick something up, and adjust the rearview mirror. The Peugeot expelled a puff of blue smoke, beeped at an African in a burnoose, and jauntily drove out into the street. It looked like Noonan was headed for the Institute, in which case he had to go around the fountain and drive past the cafe. It was too late to get up and leave, so Redrick covered his face completely and hunched over his cup. It didn't help. The Peugeot beeped in his ear, the brakes squealed, and Noonan's hearty voice called, Hey, Shoehart! Red! Redrick swore under his breath and looked up. Noonan was walking toward him, hand outstretched. Noonan was beaming. What are you doing down here at the crack of dawn? he asked as he approached. Thank you, ma'am, he said to the waitress. Nothing for me. I haven't seen you in a hundred years. Where have you been? What are you up to? Uh, nothing special. Redrick said unwillingly, just on important things. He watched Noonan bustle and establish himself in the chair opposite and move the glass with the napkins in one direction with his plump hands and the plate with sandwiches in another. And he listened to Noonan gab. You look kind of peaked. Not sleeping enough. You know, lately I've been very busy with this new automation stuff, but I never miss my sleep, that's for sure. The automation can go hang. He suddenly looked around. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you're expecting someone. Have I interrupted? Am I in the way? No, no, Redrick said lamely. I just had some time and thought I'd have a cup of coffee. That's all. Well, I won't keep you long, Dick said, looking at his watch. Listen, Red, why don't you drop your unimportant things and come back to the Institute? You know they'll take you back whenever you want. You want to work with another Russian? There's a new one. Red shook his head. Nope, a second Kirill hasn't been born. Anyway, there's nothing for me to do in your institute. It's all automated now. You have robots going into the zone, and that means that the robots get all the bonuses. The lab assistants are paid peanuts. It wouldn't even keep me in cigarettes. 
Well, that could be arranged. I don't like having things arranged for me, Redrick said. I've taken care of myself all my life, and I intend to keep on doing it. You've become very proud, Noonan said with condemnation. No, I'm not. I just don't like pinching pennies. I guess you're right, Noonan said distractedly. He looked at Redrick's briefcase on the chair next to him and rubbed the silver plate with the engraved Cyrillic letters. You're right. A man needs money so that he doesn't always have to be counting it. A present from Kirill, he asked, nodding at the briefcase. I inherited it. How come I never see you at the Borscht anymore? You're the one who's never there, Noon encountered. I have lunch there almost every day. At the Metropole, they charge an arm and a leg for a hamburger. Uh, listen, he said suddenly, how's your money situation now? One alone? Just the opposite. You want to lend me money? I have work. Oh, God, Redrick said. Not you, too. Uh, who else, then? Noonan demanded. There's lots of you hirers. Noonan, seeming to finally get his point, laughed. No, no, this isn't along the lines of your primary specialty. Along what lines, then? Noonan looked at his watch again. Here's the deal, he said, getting up. Come to the Borst for lunch, around two. We'll talk. I might not be able to make it by two. And then this evening around six, all right? We'll see. Redrick looked at his watch. It was five to nine. Noonan waved and rolled out to his Peugeot. Redrick followed him with his eyes, called the waitress, paid the bill, bought a pack of Lucky Strikes, and slowly headed over to the hotel with his briefcase. The sun was baking hot already, and the street had quickly become muggy, and Redrick felt a burning sensation under his eyelids. He squinted hard, sorry that he hadn't had time for an hour's nap before his important business. And then it hit him. He had never experienced anything like this before outside the zone, and it happened in the zone only two or three times. It was as though he were in a different world. A million odors cascaded in on him at once, sharp, sweet, metallic, gentle, dangerous ones, as crude as cobblestones, as delicate and complex as watch mechanisms, as huge as a house and as tiny as a dust particle. The air became hard. It developed edges surfaces and corners, like space was filled with huge, stiff balloons, slippery pyramids, gigantic, prickly crystals, and he had to push his way through it all, making his way in a dream through a junk store stuffed with ancient, ugly furniture. It lasted a second. He opened his eyes, and everything was gone. It hadn't been a different world. It was this world turning a new, unknown side to him. This side was revealed to him for a second, and then disappeared before he had time to figure it out. An angry horn beeped, and Redrick walked faster, faster, and then ran all the way to the wall of the Metropole. His heart was beating wildly. He put the briefcase on the pavement and impatiently tore open the pack of cigarettes. He lit one, inhaled deeply, and rested, as if after a fight. The cop stopped near him and asked, Need help, mister? No, Redrick squeezed the word out and coughed. It's just stuffy. Can I take you where you're going? Redrick picked up his briefcase. Everything, everything is fine, pal. Thanks. He walked quickly toward the entrance, walked up the steps, and went into the lobby. It was cool, dusky, and echoey. He should have sat for a while in one of those voluminous leather chairs and caught his breath, but he was late already. He allowed himself time to finish the cigarette, checking out the crowd through half-shut eyes. Bones was there irritatedly riffling through the magazines at the newsstand. Redrick threw the butt into the ashtray and went into the elevator. Hmm. I'm going to read a couple more paragraphs, and then we'll stop. He didn't manage to close the door in time, and others crowded in, a fat man breathing asthmatically, a heavily perfumed lady with a grumpy little boy eating chocolate, and a heavy-set old woman with a poorly shaved chin. Redrick was pushed into the corner. He closed his eyes, trying to shut out the boy with chocolate saliva dripping down his chin, whose face was fresh and pure without a single hair, and to shut out his mother, whose scrawny bosom was embellished with a necklace made of large black sprays set in silver, and to shut out the bulging sclerotic whites of the eyes of the fat man and the hideous warts on the swollen face of the old woman. 
The fat man tried to light a cigarette, but the old woman attacked him and kept after him until she got out on five. As soon as she did, the fat man lit up with a look that proclaimed that he was defending his civil rights and broke out coughing and hacking as soon as he inhaled, sticking out his lips like a camel and jabbing Redrick in the ribs with his elbow. Redrick got out on the eighth floor and walked down the thick carpet on the corridor, cozily illuminated by hidden lamps. It smelled of expensive tobacco, French perfumes, the soft natural leather of stuffed wallets, expensive ladies of the night, and solid gold cigarette cases. It reeked of everything, of the lousy fungus that was growing on the zone, drinking on the zone, eating, exploiting, and growing fat on the zone. And that didn't give a damn about any of it, especially about what would happen later when it had, when it had eaten its full. It says full, but it should say fill. <laughs> when it had eaten its fill and gotten power, and when everything that was once in the zone was outside the zone. Redrick pushed open the door to 874 without knocking. I think we'll stop there. I think that's a good spot. All right. Oh man, I should have chosen a different voice for Buzzard Burbridge because that fucking wheezing horse, like, <laughs> I'm dying voice, like, really hurt. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> the game time decision that really did not pan out in my favor. Um, But anyway, God, I hope it didn't sound as awful as it felt to speak it. I'll re-record if it did, whatever. Uh, yeah, a little rough. <laughs> um, thanks for hanging. I appreciate it. I, uh, I will try and be back, um, either tomorrow or Friday to read more Kugel. Um, don't know if you're a Kugel fan, Yar, but that's, uh, I'm gonna try and try and get back to two a week. It's not easy, but we'll give it a try. Um, oh, hey, Wenda Boogie, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. Uh, I will download the VOD, get it set up on YouTube, and it will be there shortly, probably like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, as always, I Dalmadir, thank you for uh, letting me use his tunes. Uh, the Lunar Lexicon remains my go-to. Oh no, Nyar, I'm so sorry. That's just awful. That's terrible. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I went through that recently too, if you want to shoot me an email or something and just vent about it feel free it's uh it's just a terrible experience i don't know there's nothing i can say other than that it's just fucking awful and and you'll be you'll get through it but it's a terrible terrible feeling um just try to remember that you gave your kitty a, a comfortable happy home a safe place to live and and someone to love but yeah, let's uh, we'll chat if you feel like it, and I will be back later this week with Kugel. Um, Nyar, do your best to just keep on keeping on for now, and just do what you can for yourself. All right, folks, I will I'll catch you later. Have a good one. <laughs>